as she said, as she said, I'm Dr. Nay with Urology of Indiana. Um, um, my particular group <coughs> has been with Urology of Indiana since 2005, but I actually uh, came to Indianapolis to practice in 1992 with uh, originally associated urologists, um, primarily working out of St. Vincent's Hospital here in Indianapolis. So been around for 29 years now as of uh, uh, July. Um, so it's a pleasure to meet with all of you and discuss prostate cancer in general, but also radiation in particular, and especially the space or um, gel implant. And we'll get into that in a sec. We'll get into the details about that in a second. The locations I work on the slide, I work out of our Carmel office, our Fisher's office, and the Broad office. Um, and you can see our website and phone number if you have any uh, further desire to get in touch with us. Um, in terms of the agenda, we're going to talk about, we'll do a prostate cancer overview, um, the anatomy, some statistics, uh, diagnosis and treatment options. And we'll talk about radiation treatment overview, and then we'll get into the space OAR hydrogel implant uh, particular uh, as the focus of this talk tonight. Um, this is a general slide of the um, anatomy that we deal with. This is a side view. So we have the rectum coming here and just in front of the rectum sits the prostate, above sits the urinary bladder. The urethra runs through the prostate and then out through the, out through the penis. Um, when we do biopsies, as a lot of you know, we do transrectal biopsies. We also feel the prostate through a rectal exam. So you can see why we can do that very easily. We can also approach the prostate transperineally, and that's important with the hydrogel uh, placement, um, which you'll see in a second. Um, in general, about one in man in nine will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Um, it's the second leading cause of cancer death in American men behind lung cancer, so it's very common. Um, so a lot of men get prostate cancer, but not as many men that who get it need to be treated, as we'll go, as we'll talk about in a second. Um, these are 2018 statistics. <clears throat> there were uh, around 165,000 new cases, around 29 and a half thousand deaths. Um, Five-year survival for localized cancer is greater than 99%. Five-year relative survival rate for all stages combined is 99%, and 10-year relative survival rate for all stages combined is 98%. So you can see, you know, prostate cancer isn't necessarily um, one of the um, tough cancers to get. Um, it's a slow grower, and you can see that even five and 10-year survival rates are quite high um, with treatment or even without treatment in some cases, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, how do we diagnose prostate cancer? Many of you on this webinar probably are already diagnosed or have been treated, so you know full well how this goes. Uh, PSA is done generally by your primary care physician, also a digital rectal exam in most cases, hopefully. Um, the, um, this is um, screening, detection of patient without symptoms. Um, the non-screen detected prostate cancer is when a patient is diagnosed during the workup of various symptoms, perhaps some pain, some urinary obstruction symptoms or bleeding. And a biopsy is really the only way to confirm existence and the severity of prostate cancer. Um, we're working on other ways to diagnose it, but it really boils down to being able to look at a piece of tissue underneath a microscope slide to diagnose the prostate cancer. Um, Couple ways to do biopsies. Traditional, this is on the right here is the traditional way we've done it. Probably most of you have had it done this way, the transrectal ultrasound. Uh, the ultrasound probe is in the rectum. And then through the um, um, transrectal ultrasound probe, a needle is passed into the prostate. The transperineal approach through this area between the scrotum and the anus, uh, the prostate can be approached through there as well. And sometimes we have to do that type of biopsy. But most of you who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, I would, I would guess, have had the transrectal ultrasound uh, prostate biopsy done. Um, 
in terms of how do we determine the severity, it boils down to grade. This is the same for all cancers. It boils down to grading and staging. Staging of prostate cancer is how, where it is, how much there, how much cancer there is, how far it's spread within the body, and grading. So that quantifies the cancer. Grading kind of qualifies the cancer to tell us how potentially aggressive it is. Um, we use the T stage for staging, and that's usually based on clinical exam um, to estimate the extent of the tumor plus imaging modalities, probably usually bone scan or CAT scan. There's newer modalities that we're using right now, such as PET scans. The Gleason score or the grade group is how we determine how potentially aggressive the cancer is. That's done, as you all probably know, by looking at the microscope slide under the microscope looking at the how the glands are arranged and how the cells are arranged, and we assign a number to that from one to five. We look at the primary number, we look at the most common pattern, and then we look at the second most common pattern and add those two scores together. Also risk or risk assessment is also done based on the blood test, the PSA test. Other things we look at quite often are the PSA velocity, how fast the uh, PSA is rising. Genomic testing or genetic testing is becoming quite common now in prostate cancer, and we utilize that for um, um, assessing what treatment options are available and how risky the cancer is. <laughs> we also look at the volume of the tumor. Um, and there are some other assorted labs that we might do as well. Um, when it boils down to treatment options, um, you meet with your surgeon, meet with your urologist to, to drill down on the uh, options. These options are based on a lot of, a lot of um, issues. So we have radiation therapy is one option. Active surveillance is something we always talk about and surgery. So here's more of the details about these options. Active surveillance is used for men with low risk or very low risk cancers or who have other health problems. Basically, because prostate cancer often grows very slowly, some men might never need treatment for their prostate cancer. Um, so we may recommend active surveillance or watchful waiting. If you're a younger man in your 50s or 60s and the cancer is not felt to be that aggressive, say it's a Gleason 6 or low grade or a, act or a favorable Gleason 7 tumor, a 3 plus 4, we may opt to watch this for a while. And it might delay, it might, we might be able to avoid treatment in some cases, but at least we're able to delay treatment and delay the side effects of treatment. So active surveillance is something that's come more and more uh, prevalent in the last 10 years. Um, we're surgeons, so we do a fair amount of prostate surgery. Uh, um, I've been <coughs> one of the laparoscopic robotic surgeons in the group for the last 14 years. Um, open, open surgery is, is a possibility as well, but probably 90% of the uh, surgeries now are being done robotically, laparoscopically, if they can be. Um, and then radiation is, is a key player in the uh, treatment options for many men. Um, there's different ways of delivering that. There, you'll hear different um, modalities being used like 3D conformal, intensity modulated radiation therapy or IMRT, there's stereotactic body radiotherapy or SBRT, there's brachytherapy, seed implants, and that can be low dose rate or high dose rate. The low dose rate seeds are permanent, the high dose rate seeds are temporary, and then proton beam therapy is, is uh, has been used in the past and it's not being used as much anymore, especially in, in Indiana when since the uh, that linear accelerator down in Bloomington closed uh, probably five or six years ago. Um, all these, so what we do when we look at a patient with prostate cancer, we go over all these options. We look at the patient's age, their general state of health. And really, if we're going to pursue an active, or an aggressive form of therapy like surgery or radiation, we really do that on a man who has 10 to a, a, a life expectancy otherwise of 10 to 15 years. And we know that there are some side effects for all of these treatments, especially surgery and radiation, bowel, urinary, and sexual side effects. Active surveillance avoids these side effects, certainly. Um, 
but it's, it's critical to talk to your surgeon, talk to your urologist about these treatment options. He'll go over all these with you, including all the side effects, the potential side effects. Um, we're here tonight to primarily talk about radiation. So we're gonna kind of segue into that um, tonight. Radiation uses direct radioactive exposure, such as high energy x-rays to kill cancer cells and surrounding tissues. Um, it can damage um, tissue around the prostate, specifically in the, or, or, it can damage tissue around the area of treatment, especially the prostate. And it can unintentionally cause damage to the rectum or the urinary bladder. So possible side effects of radiation therapy are bowel dysfunction, uh, such as diarrhea, blood in the stool, and maybe some rectal leakage. You can also have urinary dysfunction, such as increased need to urinate more often, some burning sensation when you, when you urinate, blood in your urine, or even incontinence in some cases. Um, a couple types of therapeutic radiation, the external beam radiation therapy, there's several modalities that are out there. Um, we already talked about the 3D conformal, intensity modulated, image guided, stereotactic, and proton therapy. These four really, what, what these have, um, techniques have evolved over the last 25 years so that we're able to deliver higher doses of radiation more safely and more directly to the prostate and hopefully spare the surrounding tissues of the image. And, um, but there's still a potential for damage to the or effects on the rectum and the bladder. And we're going to talk about in a second how we can avoid those. Um, internal beam radiation therapy, so-called brachytherapy, um, or seed implants. The low-dose rate implants are permanent, as I talked about. Um, the high-dose rate implants are temporary um, and are being and done on a, uh, this is done in one setting. These are done typically in two different settings. Um, and you know, they're different, not, not one size fits all. It really depends on age, the prostate size, how bad the cancer is, what your radiation oncologist is going to recommend here. Um, the problem with radiation is potential for toxicity. This, these are planning, um, looks like planning CT scans. And here you can see the rectum at the tip of the arrow right here. And here's the treatment um, plan for the prostate in this particular patient. Here's the prostate itself right here, but in order to completely treat the cancer and cure it, you need to get outside the prostate in hopes of curing the cancer and treating any potential cells that are outside the prostate. And you can see there's potential for hitting this, the top little lip of the, of the rectum here. Same thing with the bladder. Here's the urinary bladder right here. Um, the urethra is right in here, penile bulbs in here. So you can see that the bladder can be, this the lower part of the bladder can be affected with radiation therapy. Um, we need to do that so that we can get around the prostate and around the cancer to adequately and successfully treat the cancer. Um, rectal toxicity is a real problem in early um, in, an early, in a retrospective analysis uh, titled Early Tolerance and Tumor Control Outcomes with um, this particular type of radiation, a total of 551 patients received uh, SBRT. Um, around half the patients received one, a hydrogel spacer. We'll get into exactly what that is. It's basically a, 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 a polyethylene glycol gel that gets inserted between the rectum and the bladder. And you can see in the graph here that uh, the use of a hydrogel rectal spacer significantly was, assist, was significantly associated with reduced GI toxicity and lower odds of developing uh, urinary toxicity. So if a hydrogel spacer was used, there was only 1% in this particular study, 1% um, uh, of patients had had some rectal toxicity versus 6% did not have the spacer. And you can see here, in terms of genital urinary issues, um, like bladder issues, I should say, 15 versus 32%. So you can see that the, um, you can see that the um, um, benefits of the hydrogel spacer. 
So why, would, why do we use the space or hydrogel? Well, rectal radiation is often unavoidable. There's just nothing we can do about it. If we're gonna adequately treat the cancer, the rectum sits right next to the prostate. So it's going to be affected. Again, the rectum is in close proximity to the prostate. And there's movement uh, between treatments of the prostate and there's prostate movements during treatment. So if we're able to place a little gel there to kind of fix things and also to lift the prostate off the rectum, you can see very easily that we can uh, avoid the problem. Um, the rectum is the organ at risk of receiving unintended radiation. Rectal toxicity or rectal complications include bleeding, frequency, urgency, pain, potentially even fistulas, which are abnormal openings between the prostate and the rectum. These can significantly impact a patient's quality of life. Um, Radiation injury can lead to bowel and urinary and sexual symptoms that can affect patient health and quality of life during radiation therapy and for years afterwards. We see patients 10 and 15 years out with issues after radiation. So the benefits of the space or hydrogel, which, which we can insert in the office in a brief outpatient procedure with local anesthesia and, and in many cases some mild sedation with Valium. We even use nitrous oxide now for some of these, for, for some of you who want that, who need this, but it temporarily positions the rectum away from the prostate. So if you compare the pictures, look how close the rectum and the prostate are here. And if we insert this gel product, we lift the prostate off the rectum. Uh, again, it's inserted via brief outpatient procedure. Once we get everything set up, it takes about five minutes to do. So it's very quick. And, and usually very easy. Um, after about six months, the space sore is naturally absorbed and removed through the urine. So it does get absorbed and it does dissipate away. Um, the material, it's a synthetic biocompatible non-toxic material. It absorbs in approximately six months. It's made mostly of water and polyethylene glycol. PEG is used in many medical products that are inserted, including artificial tears, prescription drugs, and medical implants. It's a brief outpatient procedure with local uh, anesthesia. We can use general anesthesia if, need, if we need to. If the patient just cannot tolerate the procedure in the office, then we will do it under general anesthesia. Um, it's a very well clinically studied uh, material. Um, it's, just, it's designed to provide space between the rectum and the prostate, reducing high-dose radiation to the rectum. Control patients were eight times more likely to have a decline in bowel and urinary and sexual quality of life when compared to space OAR hydrogel patients at a median of three years in this one particular study um, that was in these studies. Uh, one was recorded, reported in the Journal of Clinical Oncology and the other one in the International Journal of Radiation Oncology and Biological Physics. So what are the clinical results? Well, there's more space. So we get more space between the rectum and the prostate. There's fewer rectal complications. There's fewer urinary complications. There's fewer potential sexual complications and a better quality of life. Again, control patients Control patients means they did not get the hydrogel. They were eight times more likely to have a decline in bowel, urinary, and sexual quality of life compared to patients who had the space or hydrogel implant. So by the numbers, there've been over 75 peer review publications. Um, it's used in many of the leading cancer centers in the United States. Um, it's well reimbursed. Over 50,000 patients have been treated worldwide. Um, we can talk a little bit about side effects. Um, when we counsel patients, where we always counsel any surgical procedure, there's small risk of bleeding, tiny risk of infection. So we do give patients antibiotics up front. Um, and there is probably the most predominant symptom is rectal um, pressure. Um, during the procedure and a short time afterward, that's usually amenable to some Tylenol or steroids or uh, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents like uh, ibuprofen or Aleve. There's a theoretical risk of uh, putting the gel implant into the prostate or the bladder or the rectum, but we're very, very careful to, to avoid that. Um, there's a chance of some rectal, uh, some erosion into the rectum of, of the 
implant in some cases, um, have not really seen that. Um, I, I think I've had one patient that it came close to doing that in, but it's just something, because the material dissolves away, it's usually not a big deal if that happens. We just put patients on antibiotics for a period of time and that usually suffices to control the situation. Um, you can visit spacewar.com for more resources, including the, um, there's a physician locator uh, with Urology of Indiana. We've got two in the group doing it, myself and Dr. John Scott. There's a patient helpline and other educational materials. Um, this is uh, some of the disclaimers we have to show um, for this talk. And I'll just leave that slide up.